Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, falls, this term's instance of this course is officially either 15213 from computer science or 18213 from electrical and computer engineering. But a large number of the people enrolled in this course are in one called 513, which is for uh, graduate students. And to be totally honest, you're not supposed to be here because you're supposed to watch the videos, uh, the lectures by video later, but we're not checking any cards, so I don't really know who you are. <laughs> um, anyways, this course is, uh, as you can see, a very popular course on campus. We have over 700, 700? 600, shouldn't exaggerate, students on campus enrolled in one of those three uh, versions of the course, which if you think about a university of the size of CMU, that's like um, about 5% of the total uh, student population. <clears throat> so uh, we're very glad to have you here. And this gain is too high. I think we overdid the gain. Try that. That's better. Um, so my name is Randy Bryant. And my co-instructor is Dave O'Halloran. And those names might be familiar if you have been to the bookstore. <laughs> because the book was written by us. And we actually wrote this book. Uh, we started 213 as a course in 1998. Uh, and I know that you were children then and all that stuff. But uh, out of response for a new type of course that you'll see today that sort of gives people a, a in-depth understanding of systems, but more from a high level or programmer's perspective. And we'll talk some about the philosophy of the course later. Uh, so this uh, book, as you saw, just came out its third edition uh, last March. And that's the required text for the course. And there is nothing you can do to avoid buying that book. And it's not because we're greedy. Uh, actually, we take the money we get from royalty for students in this course, or any CMU course, and we donate it to CMU. Uh, so we're not actually making any money out of you buying the book. But it's a simple reality that the new version is different than the old. We expect you to be using the new version. There are no electronic copies. There are no uh, pirated versions. So you basically have to buy the book. But and I don't really apologize for that, because I know you or your parents or somebody is paying uh, a lot of money for you to be here. And so the price of the book is really a relatively small amount relative to that. And uh, this course, by the way, is, is not some courses. There's, oh, yeah, this book, uh, you might want to look at it once in a while. But actually, the course has nothing to do with it. This course, the book and the course are one. They're very tied together. There'll be parts of the book that uh, we don't go into all the details that are in the book sometimes, but we expect you to be able to figure it out. And um, so really, the course and the book are tied together. And they very much, the, the progress of the course, the topics covered, how it's covered, everything about it is um, uh, consistent with the book. And, we wrote the book because of the course. Think of them as course notes. So, uh, and the reason why we are teaching this term, by the way, we haven't taught together in several years, but because this is the first rollout of this book. And uh, not only is it being used here, but it's actually used by about 250 schools around the world. And many of those people are also uh, going through the same uh, uh, activities of teaching for, from this new edition for the first time. And so we wanted to make sure all the material for the course was sort of put in order and things, because other universities and uh, other colleges use this material, uh, the, the supporting material we've developed. So that's the uh, course. And today uh, is the first lecture. We're sort of doing a tag team here. I'll talk the high level what the course is about, what the main themes are. And uh, Dave will talk more about the logistics. So uh, we refer, the, the saying we have, uh, when uh, um, the very first time I typed the number of this course, 
into a, a text editor, I realized I've typed those five digits many times in my career because it's the zip code of CMU, 15213. So <laughs> that's where we come up with the saying. So um, there's a, a few things about this course. For the most part, you know, in your normal undergraduate curriculum, when you've learned programming, you've been very much separated from the realities of the machine. You, you just think about code, just you put some text into some uh, little box somehow, and out comes a behavior that uh, it hopefully is what you intended the program to do. The purpose of this course is to give you enough understanding of what that box is doing uh, when it executes your code. And through that to help you uh, become better at what you're trying to do. So some of the outcomes is, um, there's really two types of outcomes from this course. One is that if this is the only systems course you ever take in your whole life, you will get useful material from it. You will learn tools tricks, methods that will help you uh, if you ever are involved in software development, uh, large-scale uh, software engineering projects, uh, systems, hardware design, any aspect of, of computer technology. This will help you uh, be better at what you do. You'll understand what programs do, how they work, what the machines that support them do, why sometimes they work really well, and why sometimes they don't work so well. Uh, it also is intended as a sort of stepping stone into a whole number of uh, other courses at CMU that will give you more in-depth understanding of, of computer technology, but are sort of specialized by topical area, whether it's computer networking or operating systems or uh, embedded systems, where you'll take the sort of ideas from this course and be able to then uh, learn in a somewhat narrower but deeper sense what's really going on. Uh, and so it really is trying to serve those two goals of making you more effective, giving you useful ideas and tools right away, but also preparing you for later courses. So one way we talk about this is sort of what's, why, what kind of stuff will you learn from this course is to go through a, a series of what we call great realities, places where sort of uh, computers meet up, real live computers get, meet up against your expectations and maybe they're not quite the same. So one of them is, uh, and the first part of the course is going to take a fairly detailed look at how numbers are represented in computers and you'll learn some things that are on one hand surprising and on another hand will start to make sense when you understand it better. So uh, a simple case is um, for numbers, uh, I don't know when it was, but it was probably in about eighth grade algebra that I learned that uh, if you square a number, it will be at least zero if it's not an imaginary number. So a, either an integer or a, a real number, you'd expect to square it and it to be a positive value or perhaps zero, right? Um, and that's actually generally true with floats, a representation of floating point numbers. But with um, integers, uh, or ints, you know, the, the computer representation of integers, it's not so clear. So, uh, for example, if you square 40,000 on most computers, then you'll get uh, whatever that should be, uh, as you'd expect. But what if you square 50,000? Uh, you could do this in your head, uh, but I actually built into this laptop as a computer, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. Um, let me just size this a little better for you. And use a tool which on uh, Unix systems is called no, it's going on. It's working before. Try again. Here we are. On um, Linux systems, it's called GDB, but on a Macintosh OS X, it's called uh, LLDB, but they're pretty much the same program. You will get to know this program really, really well this term. 
Uh, so, like I said, if you square 40,000, um, you'll get uh, what you'd expect. But let's change this to 50,000. And you get a, a very peculiar number that doesn't look anything like you'd expect 50,000 squared to be. And in fact, it's negative. And uh, so that might just seem like, well, there must be a mistake or something. No, that's, that's just the way it is, because uh, this computer is expecting numbers to be represented as 32-bit values. And the bit pattern that you get when you uh, do this multiplication happens to be the representation of a negative number. So that's uh, an example of where your normal expectations about integer arithmetic may or may not hold. Uh, on the other hand, there are some places um, um, like if I try to uh, do the same thing uh, multiplying 300 by 400 by 500 by 600, then all of a sudden I also get a number that clearly is not what you'd expect because the same thing has happened. I've gotten an overflow. It happens that it's overflowed to a value that's positive, not negative, but it still is obviously not the integer product of those four numbers. Uh, on the other hand, one thing you'll find is uh, even though this arithmetic is not uh, normal uh, sort of integer arithmetic, uh, it actually has some well-behaved properties. So for example, if you look at um, Uh, what I've done is I just moved the 300 around from the beginning of the product to the end of the product. And so now if you think about how associativity and commutativity works, I'm basically multiplying these four numbers in a different order. But what you see is you get the same funny looking result uh, no matter how you do it. So what you can say from this is integer arithmetic is commutative and associative. So it obeys some of the conventional mathematical properties. It just isn't what you'd expect it to be. It's not um, a um, <clears throat> uh, normal sort of mathematical integer arithmetic. So um, the cartoon here shows an example that's a similar uh, possibility. Let me get to it. Oh, I guess it comes at the end. Uh, so the, the next question is, is uh, addition associative, right? Can you order the, the numbers? And as you probably might have figured, both it, it, in the integer arithmetic, even though it has this potential for overflow, it is associative and it's uh, commutative too. But uh, for floats, it's not really quite the same uh, because the range of values you can get in floating point are so extreme that some numbers kind of disappear on you. So the example I'll show without having to use a computer to do it is uh, if you take a big number and subtract it from itself, you'll get zero. So if you add that to 3.14, you'll get 3.14. But if you take uh, those two numbers and you reorder the, uh, how you combine them so that that 3.14 compared to minus 10 to the 20th is so insignificant that that result gets turned into uh, minus 10 to the 20th. And you add that to one, 10 to the 20th and you end up with zero. So it's not associative. And so what you see is um, uh, the, both these number systems have some peculiarities and it all comes down to the fact that they use finite representations of things that are potentially infinite in their expanse. And so there's uh, some compromises in how those work. And what the compromise is, you can overflow an integer and, and run out of room. And in floating point numbers, you have round off problems where you sort of drop the digits that aren't significant. You can also overflow floating point, but the more common problem is round off. So uh, this is shown in this cartoon, this idea of overflow of uh, somebody counting sheep 
which in the US is, or in English language at least, a way to fall asleep. And when uh, he or she goes from 32,767 and then increments that by one, gets minus 32,768. And we'll see exactly why that happens, but basically the numbers are going up to the large value it can represent, and then when it goes one more, it becomes a negative number. So uh, these are really important under, uh, things to understand. I mean, 90% of the time, maybe you can just get by uh, writing programs and not worrying about whether your numbers are going to exceed their possible range. But there's sometimes when this could be really important. If you're like, uh, you know, controlling a rocket, you really don't want the positive thrust to become negative or something like that. Uh, so you can see you, there, this could be an important consideration. Similarly, there's uh, well-known instances of security vulnerabilities where somebody wrote code that sort of expected a positive number in some place and a clever person figured out if I supply a negative number, I can fool the system and get it to do bad things. So these are the kind of uh, corner cases that you need to understand better if you're either working in programs where it's really, really important that it work correctly or you're really worried about security vulnerabilities. Uh, anytime you have possible for corner cases, you have to understand these nuances better. Uh, similarly, for floating point, if you're going to use floating point for serious computation, whether it's scientific research or for designing bridges or um, nuclear power plants or something, you better understand what the characteristics are. So that's our first one, and we'll spend a couple of weeks talking about uh, numbers and number representations and their properties here. Uh, the second is uh, we're going to spend a lot of time in this course learning about machine level programming, meaning what the instructions are that actually get executed by the computer. And that can be def described in assembly language, which is a text version of it, or an object code, which is the actual bit level binary encoding of instructions. And we'll learn a fair bit about that and spend a fair amount of time seeing how code that you write in uh, C uh, gets turned into machine code and how that gets executed on the machine. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll say is that historically courses like this would teach assembly code by having you write uh, programs in assembly that uh, do uh, various things, not usually very interesting because it's a lot of work to write assembly program. This course is much more about taking the assembly code that's been generated by a compiler, a C compiler, and looking at it and understanding it. And that's a different set of skills than you need to write it on your own. Uh, and in particular, we're going to look at the language of, of Intel processors. The most recent versions of them are called x86-64, uh, the 64-bit version of their instruction set. And one thing that's new in this course compared to previous ones, we used to teach 32-bit stuff. This course is uh, 64 bits all the time. A another one that we'll talk about a fair amount and that is really fairly visible to programmers, surprisingly visible, is uh, aspects of the memory system. So modern computers have a very complex layered memory system uh, to try and give you high performance and high capacity at the same time. And uh, there's some results of that system that can uh, mean that if you program, write a program well, it might work really well. And if you don't, it could run very poorly because it's not making use of this hierarchical memory system. So, um, and also, there's a lot of bugs that show up, especially in C programs, uh, that have to do with memory referencing errors. And so understanding what those errors are, what their manifestation is, how to prevent them is a big part of the course. So for example, if I define uh, a struct that contains uh, two integer uh, values, A, in an array, and a double precision floating point number, D, and if I, um, uh, this function, fun, you'll see what it does is it's given an argument, I, and it sets the ith element of A to some uh, strange looking value. So uh, 
as you know, i should really only be either 0 or 1 um, with this code because that's the range of possible values of this array a. But uh, we can try other things too. So in particular, if you run it on either 1 or 2, you'll get what you'd expect, that you assigned uh, 3.14 to element d of this structure. And uh, when you read it back, you get the same thing. And in fact, uh, but now if I set a of 2 to uh, this number, all of a sudden you'll see that my floating point number, which seems to have nothing to do with a, has changed. And if I uh, do that same thing with uh, i equal to 3, you'll see I get a number that's closer to 2 than to 3.14. And if I keep going, uh, well, nothing much happens until I uh, hit um, uh, 6, and then the program crashes. So something interesting is going on here. At least uh, something quirky is going on. And the reason is, again, it has to do with how data is laid out in memory and how it's accessed. And one of the features of C and C++ is it doesn't do any bounds checking on arrays. It will happily let you reference uh, element number 5 million of a two element array and not complain, uh, but the operating system might complain as it did here. And it, um, in this particular uh, structure, and we'll see more about how structures are implemented and laid out, but basically the two, if each of these uh, blocks in this vertical chain represents four bytes. And so the two elements of A each are four bytes. Uh, D is eight bytes. And then there's some other uh, stuff in the other um, uh, beyond that that's not actually in the struct itself. So you'll see that if I uh, reference either A of 0 or A of 1, then I will just modify that array as designed. But when I'm calling fun of 2 or fun of 3, what I'm actually doing is altering the, the bytes that encode this uh, number d. And that's why you saw the sort of funny numbers come out of it. And as I go up, at some point when I hit 6, I'm modifying some state of the program that it's using to kind of keep things organized, most likely how it uh, keeps track of, of allocated memory. And that's causing the program to uh, crash. So this is a pretty good demonstration of uh, why C programming can drive you crazy. Uh, because as you saw, it doesn't do bounds checking. So it's easy to write code that does invalid stuff. Um, it's also often the case that you'll cause some problem. And it has this sort of action at distance feature that you can modify some think you're modifying some data structure. And what you're doing, because of the way things are organized in memory, you're changing something totally unrelated somewhere else in the program. I mean, imagine they're not just one apart, but they're 10,000 apart. And things might just run fine for hours, days, or weeks. And then always at some point, that data that got corrupted a long time ago gets accessed, and something goes wrong. So, this can be some of the worst nightmare, debugging nightmares that exist on Earth, is to try and figure out memory referencing errors. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is actually one argument not to program in C or C++, uh, and it's a valid argument, I'll admit. But also, as a, a person who's written a lot of C programming, you just get more experienced, and you know at times that you should actually put bounds checking in your own code. And there's also tools available that will help you sort of uh, uh, bulletproof your code so that it will detect these kind of problems. So it's not like you have to change languages, but it, it is a particular feature of these languages. And so understanding sort of the machine level representation of data structures and how they work is very, really makes a huge difference in your ability to uh, deal with these kind of vulnerabilities and things. Vulnerabilities, by the way, also from a security perspective. Um, the, the fourth 
sort of theme we'll cover in the course is uh, getting performance out of programs. Uh, other parts of the curriculum in CS do much more emphasis on getting the right algorithm or the right data structure. And that's really well and good. It's important stuff. I don't deny it. But there's some amount of the, the sort of low level uh, optimization that you need to do that you need to understand what the system does, what makes it run well, what makes it run poorly in order to be able to do that kind of optimization. So the example we like to use is um, these two functions do exactly the same thing in terms of their, uh, their behavior. What they do is uh, copy a uh, matrix or an array uh, from called source or SRC uh, to a destination, DST. They're both uh, sized to be 2048 rows, 2048 columns, two-dimensional arrays. And you'll see that the programs do the obvious thing. You have a nested pair of loops to do the row and column indices, and you just copy from uh, one source element to a destination element. The only thing that's different, you'll see, is that the two uh, loops uh, their nesting is different. Their nesting order is different. In one case, I'm going kind of uh, row first, going through all the rows, and then the columns, and the other is for any given row, I'm copying all the columns. That's really the only difference between these two programs. But what you'll find if you run it on a typical system is that there, one is much faster than the other. In this particular machine we ran it on, it was about uh, close to 20 times difference in performance. So something fishy is going on if the same program that differs only in this seemingly insignificant way, a way that has no effect whatsoever on its functionality, can have this much performance difference. And so to understand this, you need to stare at the cover of the book. Uh, because basically, um, you're at two different points of this uh, strange looking picture that's on your book and since there's no axes or labels on it, it makes no sense whatsoever. But it's there. Uh, so what you see is this picture shows for different memory access patterns, and I won't go into the details, uh, what the throughput measured in uh, megabytes per second uh, on, on a, basically a copying program was. And without going into the details, what you'll see is these two functions sort of sit at different points in this memory access pattern. The one that goes through row by row is much better than the one that goes through column by column. And as a result, you're getting a lot better performance, and it has to do with this memory hierarchy and the, what they call the cache memories, uh, that you're getting way better uh, performance out of it in one case than the other. So. Uh, that explains what the cover of the book is about, and uh, we'll talk about it more later in the course. And then a final part of the course talks more about not just getting computers to run little programs in isolation, but getting computers that talk to each other over networks and implement services like uh, web servers and other functions like that, which of course is where most of the world of computing sits today. It's not just isolated machines, but computers that uh, interact with each other over the network. They're embedded controllers that are uh, interacting with the physical world. So really, the, the world of computers is a much richer environment, and we'll cover at least some aspects of that in the final part of this course. So um, as I mentioned, the other feature of this course is it will get you ready for other systems courses you might take at CMU. And here we've listed actually a subset of the courses at the university that require this course as a prerequisite. And uh, they're mostly in computer science and uh, ECE. Uh, but you'll see it's quite a range of, of different courses. And uh, each of them builds on uh, sort of one or multiple aspects of the material you learn in the course. So uh, the reason why we make everyone take this course, including incoming master's students, is that all these other courses at the university have come to rely on students being familiar and having done the work of 213 uh, or 513 
uh, as a prerequisite. And they can build on that material and uh, sort of cover more ground as a result rather than having to do what would otherwise be somewhat remedial work on it. And in fact, one of the, part of the genesis of this course was the people who taught the operating system course, a 410, uh, sort of complained that they were spending too much time at the beginning of the course talking about some very basics of machine programming. And, uh, and uh, Dave and I said, oh, well, we can cover that. So that was part of what got this course started. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the course has a sort of perspective that's very different from traditional systems courses. Most systems courses, including that whole array you saw there, were about how do I build some particular feature? How do I implement an operating system? How do I design a pipeline microprocessor? Um, and uh, those are, that's all important stuff to know. We really want the people who are out there building operating systems and designing microprocessors to have learned how to do it. Uh, on the other hand, as a way to sort of get new into this and get the introduction and get the experience, we find it more useful to take what we call a programmer's perspective, meaning um, understanding uh, what you as a person who sits in front of a computer screen and types code uh, need to know about that machine you're typing code for in order to be effective at doing it, as opposed to somebody who's someday going to be designing the, the actual machine itself. Uh, so that, by taking that perspective, it gives you sort of an understanding. So now when you go off to implement it, you'll actually know what these features are and why it's important to implement them well. Uh, but also, that's, by doing this programmer's perspective, it lets you right away get tools that you can use in other places where you're writing programs or doing anything related to it. Um, and be more effective at that. So this uh, programmer's perspective really gives this uh, dual uh, benefit to it that uh, we feel is very useful and uh, students who've taken the course in the past have expressed that as well. So uh, as I mentioned, the, we have two instructors for the course um, and they also happen to be authors and uh, the, the longest, uh, we've probably taught this course uh, more than anyone else, but it's also taught by other people on campus as well. So what uh, I'm going to do now is hand my pair of microphones over to Dave. All right, uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to see you. Um, my name is Dave O'Halloran, and uh, I'm just uh, delight delighted to have the opportunity to um, uh, be one of your instructors this, this term. Um, this course is... Um, uh, one of the, the, the reason I'm so excited to be teaching this course, I mean, I just love this course, and, and the real reason is, is the, the opportunity it represents to have an impact uh, on people's lives. I, we really believe that the material you learn this semester um, can have a, a really positive and long-lasting impact on, on your careers. And it'll help you not only with your future classes, but also uh, uh, future positions you have. And I, I, I hear this from people all, all the time, uh, former CMU students and uh, students around the world who have taken the equivalent of 213 at, at their schools. Um, I even um, a couple years ago, we, we were interviewing a faculty member, a tenure, tenure track faculty member, who went to, uh, did his undergrad at CMU uh, and then went off to Stanford, got his PhD at Stanford and was coming back uh, to uh, you know, join the faculty. And he told me that 213 changed his life in our interview. Now, I don't know if he was trying to butter me up, <laughs> but I, I, I think I believe him. He, he said it changed his whole life in the sense that it gave him a, a, a research direction. You know, he didn't really know what, uh, what he, he knew he kind of liked computer science, but he, he didn't really know what direction to go. And, and after he took 213, uh, he knew that he wanted to to do his, work, his life's work in systems. Now, it was just remarkable, right, to come back and to have, we ended up actually hiring him. And he, he told me that everybody in his lab at Stanford, all of the grad students, had a copy of the book on their desk. From, and they were from all over, you know, all, all different schools. And so, I mean, I even, I was in a bookstore in Beijing uh, a couple years ago, right outside the PKU campus. And uh, I was up on the fifth floor trying to see if I could find a copy of the textbook. 
And I, I found the uh, uh, English version in one aisle. And then a couple aisles over, I found the Chinese version. And I was, I was, I was going through the Chinese version, and this guy taps me on my shoulder. And I turn around, and he says, oh, man, that, that book is really good. You should, the English version is two aisles over. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it just blew me away to be, to be in the head of someone, like halfway around the world. It was just, a, it was just one of those moments. And so I'm, I'm not trying to boast. I'm just trying, what I want, I want to give you the sense of what, a, what an opportunity this course represents for for Randy and I to, uh, to have what we hope will be a, a, a really positive impact on, on your lives. Um, <clears throat> so let me, um, we have kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a funny organization for the course to, in response to the, just the, the tremendous demand we have, we, we found that we have for it. So there's, there's actually three course numbers, um, but it's all the same course. Okay, it's the identical course. Um, 513, 15513 is for our master's students. Um, and the 513, uh, 513 doesn't have a formal lecture, so there's no seats assigned to it. Um, instead, we'll videotape the lectures, uh, and we'll, we'll make those available on the course web, web page for our, for our graduate students. And the reason we do this is just because um, in the past, well, we, we didn't have enough seats uh, for everyone. And there would be cases where there might be 100, 150 uh, uh, master students on the wait list. They wouldn't be able to get into the course. And we, we didn't really want that because they need this course for, to take other courses. Um, so that's the reason why we have this, uh, this sort of does not meet version of 213 and 513 because we can admit as many, all the master students that, that need to take the course. Now, 15.213 and 18.213 are for undergraduates in computer science and ECE, uh, respectively. Okay. And um, uh, the undergraduates will go to lectures and recitations okay, in person. Graduate students will watch videotapes of those. But otherwise, yes? Yeah, we're making them uh, available to everyone, actually. Uh, and lecture slides as well? Sorry? And lecture slides as well? And lecture slides as well. Everything's available on the course webpage. So, um, so you'll be doing um, um, the all of students will have equal access to office hours, um, the staff mailing list, and Everybody does the same labs and uh, the same exams, okay? So it's just a question, it's just a matter of whether you go to lecture in person or if you watch it on video. In fact, if, you, you know, since it's available to everybody, if you miss lecture, it'll be there on the webpage and you can catch up, which I know you'll probably do. Actually, I know most of you will never miss class, right? But the few of you who do, uh, you'll be able to watch the video. Okay. All right, this is the one part, I, this is the part I, I hate. I love teaching, but this is, this is the one part of teaching that none of us really like, but we have to talk about it, and that's academic integrity. If you're new on campus, um, or coming from an a international school, if you're an international student, uh, new on campus, um, there might be different notions of academic integrity and different notions of cheating at your undergraduate school, at your old school. So if you're new on campus, pay very close attention to this because at Carnegie Mellon, we take academic integrity uh, very seriously. Okay. It's not a wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, we're very serious about it. Um, and we, 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 want you, we want everybody doing their own work to preserve the integrity of the courses. So what exactly is cheating? So if you share code with anybody, either copying, um, retyping, if looking at somebody's code, like if you look at somebody's code on the screen, or if you give somebody a file, all of those, all of those uh, uh, examples of sharing 
are cheating. Okay. If, uh, if you describe your code like line by line to somebody, that's cheating. Um, if you coach somebody um, line by line, uh, that's cheating. Okay. Um, searching the web for solutions, just the act of searching is cheating. Right? And this is, a, this is a real problem for us in particular because the course is, is offered all around the world and uh, people either maliciously or, or sometimes just they're proud of their work and they post it you know, for employers on like public GitHub sites. So it's, it might be tempting to, uh, to search for these solutions. But even the act of searching is cheating. And definitely, if you find some, a solution and, and use it, that's cheating, even if you modify it afterwards. And I just want you to remember, I, can, I know how to use Google just as well as anybody else, right? So I, I can search for solutions, too. Um, so um, copying code, um, you know, you might, be temp uh, you might be tempted to copy code from someone who took the class uh, you know, in a previous semester. Uh, don't do it. That's, that's cheating, too. Now, what's not cheating? So you can, you can help each other use tools. Um, you know, if somebody's having trouble using GDB or, you know, they have questions about how to run, um, uh, use a text editor, that stuff's all great. You can help each other out. Um, using the tools, how to log in the shark machines, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and you can help, you can discuss sort of high level design issues, and that's probably a good idea. Yes? Can I use my own, own code that I found in a previous course? Yeah, yes. Did you take it a previous semester? Okay, yeah, the question was if you took it in a previous semester, can you use your, your work? And, and the answer is yes. Um, so it, you can also talk to each other about high-level, you know, design issues. You know, how are you? Are you using an explicit list? Are you are you using a uh, segregated list for your Malik lab? Okay, that kind of stuff is 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 okay. Okay, high-level okay, low-level not okay. And basically, what well, we want you to write your own code. This is not. You know, it's kind of a cut and paste world these days, right? You look stuff up on Google, Stack Overflow, you cut and paste it. But that's not, that's not the way we do it uh, here. We want you to do the work yourself. We want you to enjoy the experience of figuring things out and learning how to, to solve problems. Now, the consequences for cheating, um, there's a single sanction. Um, if, if you're caught cheating, uh, you'll, be, you'll be expelled from the course with an R. Uh, there's no exceptions. Uh, if you drop the course, we'll just reinstate you and then flunk you. <laughs> it's really, uh, it's a very serious, very serious um, penalty because we just take it, we take it so seriously and it's, uh, uh, And it's just, it's just something we don't want you to do. Um, we have amazing tools to detect code plagiarism. What um, we have amazing tools to detect plagiarism that are, um, that are resilient to renaming, reformatting. They operate at a very deep syntactic level. And so just please, please, don't do it. We have, I think, 18 TAs. We'll have office hours almost every day of the week. Um, there's plenty of opportunities and ways to get help. Start early. If you get stuck, start early enough so that if you get stuck, you can go ask for help. Um, we have. Uh, Automatic extensions built in if you need more time. I'll talk about that later. Form of grace days. But please, please, whatever you do, um, don't cheat. It's just tragic when it happens. Last, last fall, 25 students 
were expelled from the course. Um, some were expelled from the university because it was a second offense. Many were sent home. Uh, I talked to students who were like the only person in their family to go to college, the only person in their village to go to college, and they were going home without, without a degree. And it's just tragic. It's just So please, please, please don't do it. Do your own work, um, and it'll be a, a wonderful experience. OK, as Randy mentioned, the, uh, the textbook is uh, Computer Systems, a Programmer's Perspective, third edition. Um, you can, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, supporting material on the, on the book's website at csapp.cs.cmu.edu. Um, and as Randy mentioned, this, this book really matters for the course because actually the book came out of the course. Right? So the book is the course, the course is the book. Um, and so it, it'll, it'll really help you. Uh, the, the labs that we do come directly from material that we discuss in the book. So what I would encourage all of you to do, and I'm not sure if anybody has ever taken this advice, but I say it every year anyway, because I believe it. But I think a really good strategy for studying and preparing for this course would be to read each chapter three times. Okay, read it three times. Um, work the practice problems. So we have littered throughout the book our practice problems with solutions at the end of the, the, end of the chapter. And these practice problems are like little sort of bite-sized morsels just to kind of, just to kind of check your, uh, kind of a sanity check of your understanding of the material. So I think if you read this, if you read the book each chapter three times and worked the practice problems, you would, that would be an excellent way uh, uh, to go through the semester and prepare. Um, the other book we, we use is uh, the Kernahan and Ritchie's classic uh, C programming book. Um, I think uh, this is still, this was written a long time ago. Uh, it's still the best book around, I think, for C. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, example of technical writing. It, it was one of the inspirations I used uh, when I was writing the book. You know, I, I tried to find that same clarity and uh, precision that they, that they, they, that Kernahan and Ritchie um, uh, have in their book. So this is, a, this is a really good book. I mean, this is the kind of book, it's, it's a reference, but it's the kind of book you can just read from beginning to end and get a really good understanding of, of C. There's, a, there's four main components to the course. There's lectures where we go over the high-level concepts, uh, recitations where, uh, which meet uh, once a week, for an hour, um, led by a TA, and the, the purpose of the recitations is really to help you with uh, the labs. Right? So it's very practical and hands-on. Um, there's, th there's seven of those labs, and these are really the, the heart and soul of the, the course. This is, where, this is where all the real learning comes in, I think, when you actually have to do this stuff. And that's why we take the cheating part so seriously, because if you do these labs, you're going to learn an incredible amount of really cool stuff. If you don't do them, you won't learn anything. Right. So each one of these, uh, these labs is uh, one or two weeks each um, and involves uh, typically some kind of programming or measurement. Um, there's also two exams, a midterm and a final. The, uh, the exams are uh, proctored. They're online uh, proctored in Ween and, uh, and Gates. And what we do for the exams is we have like, we take like four days uh, from 10 to 10, and then you can sign up, and then we have like multiple clusters that are network isolated. And then you can sign up for a slot, like a six hour slot. And the, the, the midterm is like nominally like an hour, 80 minute exam, right? It's the same exam we, used, we gave when, we're, when we used to have people sitting uh, in person. So it's nominally like 80 minutes, but we give you like a, five or six hour window to do it. Okay, so there's, um, so you can sign up any time, any day that there's a slot. Okay, so there's flexibility, so you can kind of tailor it to your, your schedule. Uh, and we, I think we've also removed all the time pressure, right? So which is, you can, you can go back, you can check your work, you can, you can just kind of relax and not, not, not be worried about uh, how quickly you do it. Um,
Now, there's many different ways to get help. The main source of information is the course webpage. That's uh, www.cscmu.edu till the uh, 213. And all of the information is there. We've got a complete schedule of lectures and assignments. Uh, we don't change it. That's, it's fixed. And so you can look at that and, and plan your semester knowing that those dates uh, won't change. Uh, we've actually even got all of the lectures posted uh, ahead of time for, for the uh, other instructors around the world who are using the book. So we needed to get them all, all ready. Um, <clears throat> there's also uh, news at the, at the very beginning. There's sort of news. If, if, if we need to make announcements, uh, we'll post it there. Uh, we don't use either Blackboard or Piazza in the course. Um, instead, we have a, uh, a staff mailing list uh, that, you can, that you can send mail to uh, if you have questions. And all of the TAs and all of the faculty are, are, uh, are, are subscribed to that staff mailing list. And so we'll all see it. Um, and we usually we try to have uh, you know, really fast feedback. Right? So there, there's so many people so many people looking at, uh, at your emails that uh, chances are very high you'll get a, an answer back quickly. The, the disadvantage of having this mail, the, the advantage of this mailing list is that it allows us to control the message uh, uh, and control what, we're, if, what feedback we're giving back to you. Um, the disadvantage is that we often get the same question over and over again. And so for that, we've, we've established a fact. If we find we're getting the same questions over and over, We've established a FAQ on the, on the course webpage uh, for sort of organized by labs. Okay, so you can, um, you can see the, the answers to frequently asked questions uh, on, the, on there. Um, we have uh, office hours. I think we're still trying to, we, we, we're still trying to meet uh, with the staff and figure out the exact office hours. But what, I'm, what we're thinking now is that we'll have office hours uh, six days a week. Okay, every day but Saturday. Um, the, they will be at the same time and same place every day. So from 5.45 um, to uh, 8.30 um, in, Wien, in a, the Wien 5207 cluster, uh, we'll have 213 TAs there to, to help at, to answer your questions. Okay. So you don't have to make appointments. I mean, you can make an appointment to see any staff member, of course. Um, but you, don't, you, you know that at the same time, same place every day, there's somebody you can go to for help. Right? <clears throat> okay, for our labs and exams, every assignment, every lab is a single person, so we don't have any group projects. Okay. We want you to do the work uh, yourself. Now, you know, it's important to work in groups, and you will learn how to work in groups in other classes. Uh, CS classes, but not in 213. We want, this is a kind of a core course. We want you to figure stuff out yourself. Um, all of our hand-ins will be due at 11.59 p.m. on either a Tuesday or a Thursday. And this is, you can see which on the, the schedule page, on the course webpage. Um, and all of our hand-ins are using uh, Autolab, uh, where, um, you know, you've probably used it for some of your other classes, but it's a it's an autograding service that allows you to get instant feedback on your, on your, on your hand-in. So when you hand it in, you get feedback uh, right away. Um, the exams, like I mentioned, are going to be in network isolated clusters held over multiple days. And, and you can just sign up for a slot that's available. Now, what, what usually happens, if, if, if we offer like the exam Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the Thursday slots fill up immediately. Um, and so, you know, I guess I, you should try, try to sign up soon if you want. But people will always seem to want to defer to the end rather than, I mean, if it was me, I'd want to get it over with. But uh, So I just, that, that is sort of a, a constraint, right, that if you, you can only sign up for slots that, um, that are available. Okay, now, you know, we make mistakes. There's... We always make mistakes, especially with just so many students. So we, uh, there's, a, um, there's a, a, a specific process for appealing grades if you think that there was a, uh, that your, your work wasn't graded properly. Um, so what you do after, after either an exam or after your uh, labs are graded, 
Um, you have seven days to file an appeal, and appeals have to be in, uh, in writing and hard copy. Okay, so there's no, we won't, we won't, we won't consider any email, any appeals via email. Uh, it has to be in writing and hard copy, uh, and you give those to me. And if I'm not there, you can just slide it under the desk. Okay. And what, the reason we do it that way is it allows us to treat um, everybody fairly. So we get all the appeals together at once, and then we can, we, can, we can treat everybody the same way rather than just sort of doing them one at a time like that. Okay. Now for our labs, we have... Um, um, uh, 10 machines that were donated by Intel uh, called the Shark Machines. So initially, our first version of 213, um, in, I guess we started using Intel machines in 1999. <clears throat> we used alpha processors uh, for the first year. Uh, I like to fish, so all of our machines were, they were called the fish machines, right? They were freshwater fish. Um, and then we upgraded a few years after that, and those were the saltwater fish machines. And then we upgraded, uh, like in 2011, to these Nehalem class servers. Uh, I'd run out of freshwater fish and saltwater fish, so the next grade up was uh, sharks, right? <laughs> so every fish is, is named after some kind of shark. Um, but these are the same machines that, uh, that, you'll, that Autolab uses for grading, right? So there's some consistency for uh, performance-oriented labs like Malik Lab. Um, and you can access them. Uh, the, you, the names are listed on the course webpage, and so you can SSH to a specific machine. They're all identical. If you have an Andrew account, you've already got accounts on the machines, right? So there's nothing special to do. Or you can just uh, SSH to shark.ics, and it'll just randomly put you on, on, on one of the shark machines. Okay, if, uh, if you have any trouble logging in, just send, send mail to the, the staff mailing list. Okay, we know that during the semester, things come up. Grandparents die, especially near the, near the final. Uh, <laughs> that's harsh, I know. <laughs> but the, things come up, right? And, and you've got, you're very busy, you're taking a lot of courses. So instead of sort of dealing with requests for extensions and, you know, all these special cases, what we do is we give you five grace days that you can then spend uh, as you wish. So if you hand your work in late, one day late, you'll automatically consume a grace day. Okay, we don't allow you to sort of allocate the grace days. You, you, you spend one of your grace days by handing in late. So if you have a grace day left and you hand in late, you'll spend that grace day, but you won't be penalized for the late hand in. And so we have five grace days uh, over the entire semester uh, and um, a maximum of two grace days for the assignments. Now, we're going to set up, since the first three assignments are kind of n not as programming intensive uh, and don't take as much time, um, we're not going to allow any grace days for those because, oh, one grace day, one, sorry, one grace day. And then for the, the latter four labs, which are much more intense, we're going to allow you two, a max of two grace days. And the reason we're doing this is because um, we don't want you to burn your grace. These grace days are valuable. They're critical, especially later in the semester when it, every, you're really, really busy. Um, so we, we don't want you to burn up your grace days early in the semester. And this happens every semester. And, it, and then when Malik Lab comes up, there's no grace days left. And it's really, it's really sad to see that. Um, and so we're going to limit you to one for those first three. Uh, just to help you save you from yourself. Okay. Now, um, it, the, the, the nominal uh, late penalty, if you don't have a grace day, is 15% uh, per day. Um, and we don't allow any hand-ins three days after the due date at all. So that Autolab shuts off and then, and then that's it. Now, if there's some kind of catastrophic event, you know, then, you know, please contact us uh, for, a, for an extension, right? So we're not, you know, we try to be reasonable, but most of the, 
most of the most of the reasons that for requesting extensions, you can handle yourself by, by using your grace days. And just, uh, I mean, this is uh, this is advice I give every semester too, but I, um, but it's it's people often don't don't pay attention, but are, are just they're unable to. But but really, you, for every one of these assignments, you want to start early. Um, and the reason is you need to give yourself time to, add, to go seek help if you get stuck. Because the nature of these very programming intensive assignments like we have in 2.13 is that you're going to get stuck. And, and often it's very hard to, to bound the time you spend on, on some of these assignments. You know, it's not like problem sets where you can kind of predict, you know, this will take, eh, this will take me like three hours to do these problem sets. For a lot of the 2.13 assignments, it's very difficult to to sort of manage your time and bound your time. So for that reason, you really want to start early to, to give yourself a chance uh, to get help when you get stuck. Um, now, in the lecture hall, um, uh, you're permitted to have your laptops. Um, 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 but we ask you not to uh, uh, send email or instant messaging or cell phone texting or anything like that. If you're here, we want you to, to be attentive and engaged. Um, the, uh, the, your presence in, in lectures and recitations is voluntary, so we, we, don't, take, uh, we don't take role at either of those. Uh, we encourage you to come, but it's not required. Um, and no recordings of any kind, uh, except uh, this one. <laughs> okay, the exams and labs are weighted equally, 50%. Uh, midterm is 20, finals 30, uh, and final grades are based on a straight 90, 80, 70 uh, scale. Now, a rough outline of the semester. Um, the, the first three labs uh, cover uh, programs, the machine representations of programs and data. Um, data lab is how we teach you about bit level representations of data. So you'll solve a collection of puzzles in C. Like a puzzle might be, is, is a little function uh, that you have to implement, like absolute value. So a function that returns the absolute value of its art input argument. The kicker is that we restrict the set of operators that you can use, and it has to be straight line code, no conditionals or loops. And so to solve these puzzles, so imagine how you might try to solve absolute value without using an if statement. Right? The normal way to do it would be if x less than 0, return x, or negative x. See, I told you we make mistakes. Right? Um, but imagine how you might do that without using conditionals and only using bit-level C operations. Right, so this is how, this is how, uh, this is our way of teaching you um, how how data is is really represented in the machine. Now, the bomb lab, which you probably heard at, this is this is uh, kind of famous all over the world now, and uh, and, and at CMU. Uh, the bomb lab is the way we teach you uh, how to read and understand assembly language. And uh, a, a bomb, just briefly, a, a, a bomb is a is a C program that consists of a collection of uh, six phases. And each phase wants you to type something in at the keyboard. If you type in the what it wants you to type, what it expects you to type, um, then you've defused that phase. And it goes to the next phase. And then you have to type what that phase wants. And if you defuse all the phases, then you've defused the bomb. However, if you type in the wrong thing, then the bomb explodes by printing boom, um, and you have to try it again. And the kicker is, in either case, when, if you explode the bomb uh, or defuse a, f uh, a phase, uh, that information gets sent to Autolab. If you exp and we use the diffusing string that, that your bomb sends us, uh, and we, we check it out on a copy of your bomb that we keep on, on the server. Well, that's another thing. Every, everybody gets a different bomb, slightly different bomb. So we check. So uh, when, you diffuse, uh, when you diffuse a phase, uh, Autolab takes a string that, it, that your bomb sends us and then compares against the local copy of your bomb. If you explode, uh, phase, you lose half a point. 
So there's a real consequence to exploding your bomb. It's very, very tense. Right? <laughs> Until you learn how to use GDB to set a breakpoint before the function that sends the information to the server. <laughs> and we want you to do that, right? So a bomb's a really, the bomb's really beautiful. It's kind of fun. It's kind of like a video game. Um, it, it teaches you how to read compiler-generated code because the only, oh, the kicker is, sorry, the, the kicker is we don't give you the source code. All we give you is the binary, hence the binary bomb. So in order to defuse a bomb, you've got to fire up GDB, single trace through the, find where the code is for each phase, single trace through that code, and sort of reverse engineer it and figure out what it wants you to type in. And then you'll quickly find out where that function that explodes the bomb is, and you'll put a breakpoint there. Right? And so we want you to do that, because it, the bomb, besides teaching you how to uh, program assembly language, it also teaches you sort of organically how to use GDB, because you really can't do it if you don't, use, if you don't run GDB. And then the, uh, the third lab is, uh, this is a new lab this semester. Uh, that Randy's developed. It's called the Attack Lab. And uh, uh, we developed this lab specifically for 64-bit uh, architecture. So this is a reflection of the change from 32 bits to 64 bits. Um, and this is, uh, we're really excited about this one. You'll, you'll, learn how to, uh, um, you'll learn how to write exploits using uh, 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 return to a, a, a sort of a modern technique called return to return-oriented programming, which is kind of the modern modern way that hackers deal with the fact that stacks uh, in, in, in newer machines uh, uh, move around and, uh, and are prohibitive uh, uh, and make it impossible to execute code on the, on the stack. So this is a brand new lab. Really, I think it's really going to be, uh, really going to be neat. Um, in the memory hierarchy, when we study the memory hierarchy, we, we have a, cache lab, uh, a lab called the cache lab where you'll build your own cache simulator. So this is how you sort of learn how a, uh, this hardware uh, that Randy was mentioning called cache memory works. You'll build a simulator in C for that, and then you'll take a, a small transpose function, uh, and you'll try to make that, that code run with as, with as few misses as possible on, on your simulator. And this will involve sort of understanding of how the memory hierarchy works and how to exploit it. Um, the part of the course where you, we sort of transition from hardware to interacting with the, the system software, the, the operating system, um, there's sort of a, a concept um, that we call exceptional control flow um, that exists in all parts of the system, and it sort of represents that intellectual transition uh, from hardware to software. So um, this is how... Uh, this was sort of a, a key idea that allowed us to kind of smoothly move from, from hardware to software uh, in, in some intellectually consistent way. And so the, the ideas that you cover in exceptional control flow are like low-level hard, low hardware interrupts and exceptions, and, and, and then at the higher level, sort of involving hardware and operating system software, is the idea of, an opera, of a process context switch. Okay, and so this is, this is where you start to learn uh, what processes are, and how to, how to ask the kernel to create and uh, manage processes for you. At the next higher level are a, a, a software form of exceptional control flow called a signal. So this exists solely in the Linux kernel. And then, and then even at a, a, a higher level, at, so there's an application C language version of exceptional control flow uh, called set jump and long jump. So, this, this notion of exceptional control flow kind of exists in all parts of the system, and we cover it all at once. Um, and the, the lab that we use um, uh, to sort of exercise all these ideas is uh, called the Shell Lab. And in the Shell Lab, you'll write your own Linux shell, which is really cool. So that's the program, the command line program that you interact with whenever you log into a, a Linux box. You're going to write your own. And I don't know, for me, that was really exciting when I could like, write something that looked like a real shell. It was, it was pretty neat. Um, uh, 
The next area is, uh, we'll study is called virtual memory. Um, virtual memory is a sort of combination of hardware and software um, that presents an abstraction to you of this very, of memory as a very large array of bytes. Um, when in reality, memory is a hierarchy of, of hardware and of cache memories and DRAMs, virtual memory uh, provides a very high level abstraction as, as just a linear sequence of bytes. It also does, provides a lot of a lot of other useful abstractions that make many different parts of the system much easier to manage. Okay, so we'll learn, we'll learn about virtual memory, um, we'll learn how it works, we'll learn about the performance impact, potential performance impact that it has on your programs, um, and, and we'll also learn how to manage that large pool of, of memory that it makes available to you. And the lab that we do that, uh, the lab where you'll do that is called Malik Lab, and in, in the malloc lab, you'll write your own malloc and free uh, functions. Okay, so you'll, you'll re-implement the functionality of the libc malloc and free. And this is a, um, maybe, a maybe it's two pages of code. But it'll be, I guarantee it'll be the most sophisticated, uh, difficult two pages of code you've, you've written. Not only because since it's managing the memory system, you can't use all of, I mean, C doesn't have many, C doesn't help you out a lot um, with uh, abstractions for data structures. But when you're writing, but at least it does give you ideas like uh, structs, and unions that you can use to, to structure your memory. When you're writing a malloc package, you can't use any of those. You have to write exclusively on pointers and casting. Um, because your uh, malloc package is working at such a low level. Um, and so it's a very, very difficult uh, piece of code um, for that reason, but also the design space for malloc is, is enormous. You have many options. They all have implications that trade off performance and, uh, and memory efficiency. And finally, in the last part of the course, <coughs> um, we, we deal with I.O., input-output. So, so far in the course, we've just talked about sort of running programs on machines. In the last part of the course, we'll talk about input and output, sending data into and out of the machine. So we'll look at basic concepts of Linux I.O. Um, we'll, um, and since I think the most interesting form of I.O. Is, is networking, which allows you to talk to machines anywhere in the world, uh, using the internet. Uh, we'll also talk, we'll learn how to do network programming. You'll learn how to write programs that uh, use the sockets interface, uh, uh, which is the basic interface for the internet, uh, to talk to machines, any, potentially any machine in the, in the world. And that's really exciting. I mean, once, I can still remember when developing this course, I had two windows open on my machine I was SSH'd into two different machines, and I wrote a program to send a message like hello world from one machine to the other. And when that hello world appeared on the second window, it was like so exciting. I mean, if you're a nerd, it's really exciting. <laughs> but, but just the thought that that could have been any machine, right? That could have been any machine. That, that, it's just like opens up a whole new world. Okay, all of our, uh, our hand-ins are using a system called Autolab, which was developed here. Um, and you can access it. If you, if you are on the roster as of this morning, if you go to the Autolab link, then you'll see this course listed <coughs> on your page. Uh, if you're not enrolled, uh, you won't have an Autolab account. Um, and you have to be enrolled to get an Autolab account. So, if, you're, if you want to try to wait it out and wait for people to drop, I'll make the first couple of, at least the first assignment do available from the course webpage. So you can work on it without actually handing it to Autolab. But at least you can keep going. Um, okay, if you enroll, actually I didn't update this, but I, I updated the Autolab accounts uh, today. Now, one final thing, if you have wait list questions, um, Please don't, um, don't send email to the staff because we, we don't control the waitlist. So um, 
you should contact one of these, uh, either Kathy, Catherine, or Zara, uh, depending on which class you're in. Okay, so that's it. Welcome again. Looking forward to a great semester, and we'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>